Well, it's wonderful to be welcoming Ray Gator to the monthly book to speak about our first choice for 2013, and that's uh, J.M. Kurtzia's The Childhood of Jesus. Now, normally, Ray, we'd be speaking to the author, but as you know, J.M. Kurtzia, John Kurtzia, is famously uninclined to speak about his books. Uh, and that's been a long-standing position. I read in a recent biography of Kurtzia by the late J.C. Cannemeyer that he quotes a Jeffrey Hare Snape, a member of a poetry group that Kurtzia belonged to at the University of Cape Town. And he remembers that Kurtzia would read his poems, which were usually in the manner of T.S. Eliot or Ezra Pound, and then maintain absolute yeah. silence in the discussions which followed. And uh, he goes on to say, silence can be very unnerving, especially when it's used by someone who gives every evidence of being confident in it. And, uh, and critic James Lay writes that admiring of the writings of Samuel Beckett, another author notoriously reluctant to pronounce on the meaning of his creations, Kutzia had already, already intuited that there were liberating possibilities in denying the author's official stamp of approval for any given interpretation, and that in granting this interpretive freedom to the reader, there were liberating possibilities for the author himself. So, fair enough, we have the book. What more do we want from him? And it's up to us to make, make out what it means to us, yeah. I guess. So, Ray, I thought as a philosopher and who's a writer and who's written about moral and ethical matters and who's engaged in public debate and who's met John Kurtzia, and in fact, he launched a book of yours a few years ago, that you would be a good person to speak with about this very simple, very beautifully written engaging but absolutely philosophical novel and I should say that you have you have taken up your bed and walked <laughs> haven't you <laughs> because you've had a back operation recently and you're taking medication and so if you grimace a little bit it won't be because of our conversation That's it will right. be because <laughs> you're in pain but thank you for coming oh, it's in. a great pleasure and uh, uh, I should perhaps say before I say anything else uh, about uh, the book that uh, we're going to discuss uh, and that is that when you invited me to speak about this and I agreed, I went back to reread a lot of uh, John Goethe. And I've been thinking uh, about what difference that actually makes. Uh, because the book we're going to talk about is, I think, a pretty enigmatic book. I, I've read a couple of reviews and uh, almost everybody says it's, it's wonderful, but what, what on earth does it mean? Uh, as, as some people are rather irritated, actually, I gather, by um, its enigmatic character. Uh, but what I felt when I came to it uh, and read it for the first time, it felt even more, actually, when I read it the second time, having read quite a lot of his other, reread a lot of his other work, was how much I trusted him. And I wondered uh, whether my... Um, my, my, my just being open to the mystery of this book uh, is in part a function uh, of the fact, or, the, or let's put it this way, the way in which I'm open to the mystery of this book is in part a function of how much I trust Kurt Sayer. Trust him to do what? Well, uh, well I trust his seriousness. I mean, he's a, a, an understatement to say he's an innovative writer. Uh, uh, um, and, uh, I mean, he's not the only one. And sometimes you get the impression that uh, writers feel they have to do something new or something interesting in, in almost the pejorative sense of interesting. You know, when people say, ah, oh, that's interesting, meaning God knows we don't, you know. Uh, and he's, he's not like that. And, and I, um, this is maybe one of the ideas we explore, but when, when I keep thinking about uh, the, the incredible quality of his prose and uh, the uh, wonderful construction of all those sentences which are so, so crafted, uh, I felt that you couldn't characterise in the end the aesthetic quality, first of all just of those sentences and then the entire structure of the book and so on, you couldn't characterise that adequately without reference to some concept of truth or truthfulness. 
It's a complex notion of truth and truthfulness, obviously. But I think if one wanted to say, oh, look, he's just a fantastic writer and he's a great experimental writer, and just try to deploy ascetic categories, as it were, without ones that resonate against a serious concept of truth and truthfulness, I don't think it would be adequate to the book. And I don't think I would trust it in the way that I do. Well, I described it as a philosophical novel. Would you agree it's a philosophical novel? Well, it is. Uh, well, there are different kinds of philosophical novels. I mean, there are philosophical novels in the, in the sense uh, that big ideas are discussed in them. I mean, Dostoevsky is a good example, and uh, he's a writer that Kurtzsey admires greatly. Uh, and there are other uh, novels which are more explicitly philosophical, that is, philosophers are either mentioned, uh, as you get in Kurtzsey's uh, Costello, or larger, uh, especially the bit about animals. Uh, but here, uh, it, it's Plato who's right there <laughs> against the background. Not mentioned, uh, actually, uh, I think for the very explicit reason that this is wherever, wherever this takes place uh, is a place without a history. Uh, but, but isn't it true that, that um, philosophy has tended to hold itself at a distance from literature and, and it's all Plato's fault, of course? I mean, he, he had views about people who told the well, truth and, and poets and the role of, of this yeah. kind of literature in, in a society. Well, Plato is known uh, to almost any first-year student who's done philosophy as the man who banned the poets from the Republic. Uh, it's also true that Plato was a great poet stroke philosopher. Uh, and if you think of, let's say, Socrates, then the Socrates who haunts the West is not the historical Socrates, it's the character in Plato's dialogues. And were he, Plato not such a great poet, that character would not be still haunting us. But actually that's, uh, that, that enables me to make uh, an important point here, I think, which is that uh, in you've got the concept of a character as it exists in Plato's dialogues, which is the work of a poet. But the characters in this book, for example, have to be much more substantially novelistic characters. Uh, nobody would dream of saying of Plato's dialogues to say, oh, they're a bit didactic. We've got all this philosophy in that all time, and Socrates is always telling us this. And yet it, I, th I think it's always a big fault, a, a, a very serious fault in any novel, and I'm absolutely sh sure that John Kutzea would agree uh, if the characters started becoming mouthpieces uh, for philosophical ideas. Um, they're, they're not mouthpieces, but there's a lot of questioning about yeah. all kinds of philosophical questions. So ma maybe we should start by, from the very first page, and I felt unsettled from the very first page, um, new arrivals, a man and a boy, arrive at uh, this center of resettlement. Um, and uh, it's a centro de resettlement novia. Um, it, it's Spanish. Um, we later actually discover that they're not, they're not even speaking English to each other because they don't understand English. So we're reading this book in English. We're set in, Spa in some kind of Spanish-speaking place. Uh, we find out a little bit later that these guys are actually speaking German and um, we're confused. And we're also confused because a man and a boy come, they need some help, they're new settlers, and we discover that the people who are in charge of the place don't seem to be behaving towards them in the way that we might expect. Yeah, well, I... I, I... I thought when I started thinking about the inadequate quality of this uh, book that at, you, you could read it at one level just as a straight narrative without highlighting the strangeness of it. You could say, look, a boy and uh, a man who's not his father, not his uncle, arrive and they're settled here. The man walks on, or works on the wharves and uh, looks for the boy's mother and, and looks, uh, after, the looks boy. after the boy. And, and one could pretty much tell a narrative right through, which would be engaging, uh, lo lots of suspense, characters wonderfully drawn. And then one could, as it were, retell the story with all the strangeness in it that uh, 
that, for, that, that, that they were, written, were reading it in English when they're supposed to be speaking Spanish, but the boy recites a poem in German, but says it's English and so on. And you, and you, and you begin to realize that, that, that it's, it's not Spanish as, as we know it, and it's not any language as we know it, because languages as we know them, and I think this is a point very important to get to here, have deep histories. Uh, and it's because they have deep histories and all that there's so much possibility of illusion and resonance uh, in a language, which the, Span the Spanish, <laughs> inverted commas, doesn't have. And uh, one, of the, 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 one of the main characters not, makes a point that there's no irony <laughs> Uh, in this language, which I take it to be a kind of uh, saying, look, th th there's nothing here that really counts as tone. Tone doesn't matter in this place. Uh, there's a kind of straightness about everything, which he complains about as being, they're all very generous and kind and all the rest, but there's no passion, there's no irony, there's no ambiguity and so on. And nobody has any memory of anything. No, no, and not just because, as a matter of fact, they've forgotten. Which is, at one stage, you're inclined to think that, that I don't know, if something happened, they just Well, they've been things. through some terrible well, situation, some trauma. trauma. That's why I don't remember. No, but uh, you know, that you, uh, you, we soon discover that uh, this is supposed to be a place where there is no memory, uh, because it's a place without a history, and in the same way, the language has no history. And there's a certain point, you will remember, uh, a, w a wonderful p uh, a passage uh, actually about labor and the dignity of labor and it's because um, uh, this character Simon gets uh, work as a stevedore uh, and he's taking grain off the ship on, onto shore and at one point he wonders how come they don't use cranes <laughs> for example to do this and he notices that a lot of, there are a lot of other wars but they're empty and he says, well, why, why, what's, what's going on there? Maybe I can get a job there. And they say, we've well, got a job there. You wouldn't have much to do, you know, because we need bread. So this is a big symbol. We all need bread. And that's part of the dignity of the work. It's not just labor, but providing bread. Who needs bicycles and all the rest of it? So, but, uh, but uh, why, it, it, it's at so many layers, this, this passage, because on the one hand, it's a, about the dignity of labor, which is so cruelly then eroded, because he, the man who, there is a, there gets to be a discussion, why are we doing this? Why don't we have cranes? There's philosophical discussion on the wall. And uh, a man, the, the foreman says, well, you come and look at our grain house. You'll be really, we're really proud of it. And he goes there and it's just full of rats. And the rats are eating the grain and he says, for God's sake, if there weren't these rats here eating the stuff, you'd be, it'd be full, you'd have nothing to do. You know what that reminds me of? I mean, I remember uh, the miners' strike under Margaret Thatcher. And uh, the miners in Britain, especially the ultra miners, were, as it were, the symbol of old labour, dignity of labour. And Thatcher knew, of course, she had to crush them if she was going to move into, into what she took to be the right future. But one of the things that enabled her to do, do it was that she kept telling the nation that these miners were labouring every day, but every day the state was subsidising to the tunes of millions of pounds. And suddenly you thought, what's... What's happened here to the idea of dignity of labour? Because you're not even paying your way. Mm. And I felt the same, that was a, in a way the same point there. But one of the reasons he insists on, on, on or hopes that they'll have cranes, put cranes, is because he thinks that will be a way in which time stops being cyclical. It, it'll be working into the future and they'll create a history. Um, because this is a place of without no, history, time, without no time, with, without, without history. Um, people are washed clean except of memories. Um, they, um, we don't know whether they're dead. Is yeah. this an afterlife? Is this a kind of holding pattern? Um, because they don't really understand the, the language, they don't really know who they are. 
They don't really know who anybody else is. It's very, very unsettling, isn't it? But we do know that there's a goodness. This man and this child, this man is caring for this child who's not his own child. Um, so there is a, 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 a we're, we're comfortable with this man, I think. Um, this man, uh, David. Was it Simon? No, the boy's <laughs> Okay. This man, Simon, or Simon, and the boy is David. And um, we're looking for this mother that, that uh, Simon is sure he's going to find. It's also layered in that we're, we're, we're looking at the relationship between men and women. And he's interested in talking about what sex is and what love is and what attachments are and what mothering is and what parenting is. Yeah. And, and, as, and again, at, at, at different levels of irony. Uh, so, uh, so, for example, um, this may be a bit of a dig at Marx, you know, because here are these, these labourers, there's all this, there's the very eloquent, and, 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 and they're, they're not, um, I don't think, ironic uh, descriptions of the dignity of labour and the way in which uh, Simone at one stage, when he begins to ridicule it because they're just going around in circles, then he feels remorseful. And, uh, but these the, these uh, labourers also go to an institute where they uh, study philosophy, philosophy, amongst other things. Uh, and uh, the, the the only thing we're told really about the philosophy that's done there is that is that they're interested in what makes a chair a, a chair, in the sense that uh, in the sense of what enables us to bring these many many different objects. Uh, under the same concept, and this is this is, was a very serious question. Well, it, it in fact it has been a very serious question throughout philosophy, but it was Plato who is usually credited as introducing it as one of the great problems of philosophy. And Simon there is quite impatient with it all. He partly because he really wants to go to the life drawing classes <laughs> where he can see the woman he lusted after naked, uh, but uh, but also because. Um, He's, 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 he says that he's not interested in this sort of philosophy. He wants philosophy that can shape you. But, you know, all, all, all before he gets to this philosophy class, he is thinking, he's always asking, asking questions, isn't yeah. he? He's asking, what is human nature? Uh, are there more important things than money? How one lives? Uh, does sex bring men and women closer? Have you ever asked yourself whether the price we pay for this new life, the price of forgetting, may not be too high? Um, a conviction, an institution, a delusion, what is the difference when it cannot be questioned? Um, what are the rights of the child? Why are the rights of the child always trumping the rights of grown-ups? Is this the best of all possible worlds? I mean, these are age-old philosophical questions, moral questions yeah, that he's yeah. more interested in. Yeah. Well, what, in, in, I mean, the, at, at one stage in, in, in response, well, it, actually it, it follows not too long after his impatience with the way in which people are asking the question. Because he says he does not care about chairs and their chairness. Yeah, yeah. But at, a, but at uh, if, if I can later on find the passage, he does take some of these ideas seriously because there's a wonderful passage actually where they're talking about numbers. Oh yes, uh, um, the law of numbers being stronger than the law of nature. Yeah, well it's partly that, but it, it, it's at a certain point where he tries to understand uh, he, he says at a certain point to a fellow Eugenio who's uh, who's been going to the philosophy classes and, and uh, Simon later confesses to finding him rather irritating even though he's a very nice man and so on because he's rather prim. Mm. But he and Eugenio, Simon and Eugenio have a discussion about the boys what, what at, at one point seems to be the strange conception of numbers because he has this idea that numbers uh, that, for example, a number might disappear. Mm. Right? So we go seven, eight, nine, and David has this idea, but maybe, maybe nine will disappear. There's, there has been a long uh, discussion beforehand about uh, David the boy fearing to fall down cracks, 
uh, fearing to fall through a hole in the page of Don Quixote. And there are some interesting sort of, I don't know, playful, not playful, sort of conceptual analysis type points. Look, a, hole, a crack is not a hole. A crack and a hole, is, you know, a hole is something. A crack, a gap, a, a hole. Gap. These are, these are inter sort of distinctions made. Uh, 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 Simon uh, says, and after he's been very, previously been very patient with David, he says, for goodness sake, numbers are not like this, they're like this, you know. He says, look, while I was in hospital with nothing else to do, I tried as a mental exercise to see the world through David's eyes. Put an apple before him and what does he see? An apple, not one apple, just an apple. Put two apples before him, what does he see? An apple and an apple, not two apples. Not the same apple twice, just an apple and an apple. Now along comes Senor Leon, that was his teacher that he wants, the boy wants to escape, and demands, how many apples, child? And what's the answer? What are apples? What is the singular of which apples is the plural? Three men in a car heading for the east blocks. Who is the singular of which men in the plural? Eugenio, these are the three men in the car, Eugenio or, or Simon or our friend the driver, whose name I don't know. Are we three or are we one and one and one? Now, this is a point where I, where, where I, actually, I, I, I uh, this is a point of real seriousness, uh, actually, I think, uh, and it's in, in, enigmatic, but it's taking up in a different way uh, the issue that is in a way that Simon finds frivolous and irritating is being discussed in the philosophy classes. But let me just read you this, which is, I think is so beautiful. He, he, goes, uh, he, he, he says to Eugenio, you throw up your hands in exasperation and I can see why. One and one and one make three, you say. And I'm bound to agree. Three men in a car, simple. But David won't follow us. He won't take the steps we take when we count. One step, two step, three. This is what's beautiful. It's as if the numbers were islands floating in a great black sea of nothingness. And he were each time being asked to close his eyes and launch himself across the void. Hmm. What if I fall? That's what he asks himself. What if I fall and then keep falling forever? Lying in the bed in the middle of the night, I could sometimes swear that I too was falling, falling under the same spell that grips the boy. If getting from one to two is hard, I ask myself, how shall we ever get from zero to one? The reason I think... Look, I don't, can I going to say a little bit about why I think this is serious? And I, I'm not sure, but I think another great philosopher who's in this book but is not named, as I say, not because he's been coy, but because this is a place without a history, <laughs> uh, is Wittgenstein. And one of the things that Wittgenstein, uh, 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 if I could put it this way, he, he asked what, what, what enables us to be sure about the rules of mathematics? You know, we make a series 2, 4, 6, 8, and then we think 10, but why, why, why shouldn't we go elsewhere? Because every rule, he says, requires an interpretation, and then there's an interpretation. What, what Wittgenstein did here is, is question the, as it were, the necessities the, that are in mathematics and which someone like Plato thought and the great Pythagoreans thought actually held the cosmos together. together. Right? And it's not, it's not old. Uh, it's, sorry, it's not just old. I saw a program once of... Uh, uh, it's called The Origins of the Universe. It was on the BBC, and there were these high-flying astrophysicists. And I couldn't understand a word of the program because it was, went on for four hours. But what struck, what kept me going all the time was, their, first of all, a sense of the joy and their sense of the beauty of the world. And it was all numbers <laughs> for them. I thought, my God, these are the new Pythagoreans. <laughs> uh, but, but and, and the other thing, if I might come back to something we were saying about truth, and that's going on, I think, in this book too, is it made me realise, Simone Weil has a wonderful uh, saying. She says, instead of talking about the love of truth, uh, we, shall, we should speak about 
uh, uh, um, truth in, in love. And he, in this case, it was a, a concern for truth in being true to the beauty of the universe for these astrophysicists. But of course, if you, if you, if you and collapse this idea that there is this necessity holding everything together, and that maybe there are these gaps, and it's, there's a sense in which it's arbitrary, anyway, not, you know, not, not, not necessitated by something big in the universe. And if it somehow, perhaps, now this is reading a bit of Wittgenstein, in, in some sense of this very difficult phrase of human origin, uh, then, this is after, I don't know if I want to introduce this topic at this stage, but this after all is called the childhood well, of Jesus. Well, I was about to introduce it because, you know, I was thinking this between, is the human. between these islands that you describe and the dark sea between them, one needs a leap and maybe a leap of faith. And this is called the childhood of Jesus. And um, I, I, I know that we've both been reading the um, letters to uh, Paul Oster between J.M. Kurtzer and Paul Oster yeah. a, a few years, I think 2008 to 11, something like yeah, that. Yeah, I finished in 11. And, um, August 11. and uh, Kurtzer says, I would not be who I am without Freud or Kafka to say nothing of that aberrant Jewish hmm. prophet, Jesus of Nazareth. So it's important to Kurtzer. Jesus is important to Kurtzer. And I think uh, the idea of grace has been... Uh, with him throughout a lot, most of his writing, I think. And let's talk about why this book is called The Childhood of Jesus. Why do you think it's called The Childhood of Jesus? Because towards the end of it, there's a kind of, there's quite a few Jesus, Jesus scenes yeah. that we, we see. Um, uh, well, Simon says he wants a saviour at one stage. He takes up his bed and walks. Um, uh, David, uh, David has wounds from barbed wire on his hands. Um, David is trying to save people on the way to the new life. Um, David writes, I am the truth. So how do we understand this book in terms of Jesus? Uh, I really don't know, I have to say. I mean, and there's another question of how much that matters, which we, we might talk about. Um, in, in, in the passage you quoted from the letters, it's very interesting that he refers to Jesus as that aberrant Jew and refers to him not as Jesus Christ, but Jesus of Nazareth, which very few people do, actually. It, it, even atheists and, uh, often refer, and not even to Jesus Christ, but to Christ. And uh, I remember when I first read Jesus... And what's Jesus, the difference? Well, well, there's no commit. I mean, well, to call him the Christ is is actually to to means the Savior. I mean, the, the Messiah. And, but uh, but just to refer to him just as that historical figure, Jesus of Nazareth. But the, actually, this see we can be, now this is the whole problem of Jesus as a historical figure. I mean, for for someone. I mean, there, there are, let's see, three kinds of people here. There are the, there are the people who, I think Paul Austin quotes in, in that, in that uh, one of his letters, and it says that there's this fellow, when they're talking about English, uh, in uh, what, what, what ought to be on the school curriculum in America, and some fellow says, if English was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. So there's that kind of person we call a fundamentalist. Or who has no doubt whatsoever that Jesus is as much an historical figure as Julius Caesar. You know? uh, except, of course, we know as a matter of fact that they're not open to the Gospels being in a historical inquiry. So, so even with those people who call themselves as fundamentalists and say that, we know that they, they, they instinctively feel there are difficulties because they won't accept historical inquiry, really. And uh, then there are the Christians who, for a very long time, uh, the whole problem of the historical Jesus is, is very difficult. They don't know what to make of it. And then there are people who are not Christians, who are not even religious, but who take these, the, let's say, the Gospels as, as being somehow very important in, in not just historically in our cultural life, but, but they still have deep resonances for them. Uh, 
But the question then is, is whether uh, the, uh, the question then is whether an interest in the childhood of Jesus. We're told nothing about Jesus' childhood in the Gospels. And in, as far as I know, only in Luke, where there's a little bit of this character, actually, because uh, in Luke, uh, uh, Mary and Joseph go off to Jerusalem and suddenly the boy disappears and they find him in the temple and discussing matters with the rabbi and their rabbis are all amazed at his wisdom and they, they scold him for <laughs> being so naughty. As, and, he, and then he establishes that, uh, I can't remember exactly what he says, but it's one of those distancing remarks, as though to say, you're not what matters, my parents, uh, which, which happens in, in this book, and which happens, uh, there's, a, there's a passage in Matthew's Gospel, uh, that the Christians hardly ever, ever quote, but um, it's where Jesus says, you not, you, the translation is, if you're not prepared to hate your brothers and your sisters and your mother too, then you cannot follow me. Not many people quote that. It's, it's a frightening passage. And the, actually, I'm not talking too much, but it's wonderfully brought out in Pasolini's film. Uh, it's, it's interesting that you should, uh, you're, uh, a gay communist should make one of the <laughs> most interesting films about the, 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 the Gospels. The band film. Uh, yeah, the band film. But, but, what, but what I'm, I'm trying, to, trying to bring out is, is that one, one, one might think if, if, if one is, as I imagine John Kutzer is, someone who's deeply moved by certain passages in, in, in the Gospels, you might think it's as irrelevant to ask what was Jesus like as a boy uh, as it is to ask how many children had Lady Macbeth. Because it's not the historical Jesus that is, you know, you, uh, of, of, of interest. And I sometimes wonder whether one thought that one might not carry away from this book uh, is that Kurt C is, is saying, who cares about the historical Jesus? Because after this conversation that I read out about numbers, Eugenio says, oh, well, he's a strange boy, a weird boy. Maybe, you know, we, 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 maybe he's neurotic about this or neurotic about that. And so there's a kind of opening up of uh, the possibility of a psychology that's going to explain what the boy David is like and all his strange carries on. And that's pretty much rejected straight away by someone. But if, if, one, if one were to become, let's forget this book, if one were to become interested in the childhood of Jesus of Nazareth, for what purpose? Presumably for the purpose of thinking you could understand better what, what the man said. I think one of the things Kurt Sayer would say is, don't, don't, you know, and he, I had this quote somewhere, but he says, all wondrous things come from nowhere. And then he says, he's saying this to Innes at one point. And then he says, oh, did I really say that? <laughs> but, 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 but this idea of, 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 of wondrous things coming from nowhere and, and perhaps the idleness of thinking that we could have, for example, psychological, sociological explanations which would reveal to us what's, what we most deeply want to understand if we're troubled by or puzzled by mysteries in the Gospels. And I feel, in a way, that's true of this book. I suspect it's true of this book, too. But I had an experience, if I might put it this way, because I, I, I once wrote about uh, Kutzey, uh, what we might call the philosophical aspects, in, in a book called The Philosopher's Dog. And, uh, you were looking at disgrace. Yeah, yeah. Well, well two things. One, in disgrace, what, what, I found, well, what, what I found interesting about him, as, uh, uh, from the point of view of, view of a philosopher, in disgrace, was he wasn't just, uh, as it were, putting up philosophical ideas and saying, what do you think of this idea or that? He was in, in one really important part of disgrace where he's describing the terrible treatment of dead dogs. He's inviting us actually to see whether the concept of dis dishonour is a concept you're prepared to apply. Dishonouring is a but the passage that I, I, I'm, I'm thinking of is, is, is at the end, where on the face of it, it looks as though he's comparing what is done, the terrible things that are done worldwide, uh, to animals, to the Holocaust. 
Uh, and I wrote that somehow this was a, a hopeless comparison, that of course you could be horrified by, by this, uh, and, and even hope for a day when what we now regard as uh, uh, perhaps a bit distasteful, but we might regard that as criminal without comparing it. And then a really fine philosopher, in fact the philosopher to whom uh, I dedicated um, the philosopher's dog, said it's not a matter of comparison, this is too crude. What he's doing here is, is something uh, much, much more radical, much, much, with much greater capacity to shake us than the, than the simple idea that he's saying, this is a bit like that, to which one responds, well, it's not like that. And one so, might even say it's indecent. So, so uh, and that's partly why I emphasised earlier that, that it's because I trust him so much that I still don't know how quite to understand those passages in the lives of animals about the Holocaust. What about the idea that um, I mean, a, a kind of um, a primacy of feeling, of, of basic issues of empathy and sympathy and, and solidarity in a sense, I think in that Costello work, but also in this work too, that um, that he makes us read and feel, and somehow the, f the way we feel is something that we should notice and see as important. We don't necessarily only have to think through everything. We have to feel through things too, um, which is surprising to me because I've, I've seen him as a kind of cool writer previously, especially those um, books about his childhood, a boyhood, youth, um, a kind of step, step away from the story, um, questioning himself all the time, questioning the character who writes it, um, uh, and not just sort of unengaged in a sense, but self-questioning all the time. But this, this also makes us feel, um, and then there's a very strange passage of, of um, Simon unblocking a toilet, mm. where you think, um, you know, and this is all about this abstract relationship, the double nature of, of the human being. We, are, we partake of the ideal, but we also shit. And then we have to unblock this toilet. And he goes through this very, very, very close plumbing of uh, how you unblock the toilet. And I, and I wondered what you made of that passage. Why was that there? Well, it had, it, 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 it had a... a an it was operating too at a number of levels. Because there was sort of revulsion on the one hand. I mean, I felt revulsion on the other hand. I thought, well, people do have to unblock toilets. It's well, logical. Yeah, well, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't revulsion like you get in Swift, for example. I mean, and it's true, it was called... About eating babies or something, uh, right? No, well, uh, about his uh, Celia shit, Celia, do you remember that terrible one? And he couldn't bear the thought that this woman also shat. Interestingly, it's called poo here, but that's through the eyes of the, 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 the child. But it also enables a joke to go through because um, they've been talking about what makes a chair a chair and the ideal chair. And Plato, uh, Plato was in fact troubled when someone suggested, well, maybe there's not just a former idea of a chair, but of mud. <laughs> And so uh, um, the idea that there might be a, the form of what makes this bit of poo and that bit of poo <laughs> in the heavens eternally there. So there's, there's, there's a follow through of that, that sort of joke. But underneath it, of course, there is all, also the uh, exploration of what it means to be a creature, uh, which uh, in all sorts of ways is being denied uh, in, by people in that, quote, place, because there's, so, there's a long discussion about the nature of desire. There's that um, a wonderful uh, discussion right at the beginning with the young girl, Anna, to whom he's attracted. And uh, uh, she knows that he's attracted and uh, uh, challenges him to have a conversation in front of the boy about what, what he thinks this is all about. And uh, he, he 
says that he's attracted to her beauty. Or she says, actually, you're attracted to me, no doubt, because I'm good looking, perhaps even beautiful. And he says, yes. And she, and he, she says, why should that have anything to, to do with it? Uh, and then uh, he, he, he says, well, just to, to see the beauty in a woman is a, is, is a wonderful compliment. And she says, well, this thing you want to stick in me, is that beautiful? And the, this part of me you want to stay, is that? And he says, no, 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 it's, like, it, it's the whole. <laughs> Sorry, didn't mean. <me. laughs> it's the whole. Uh, now, in, in a, I mean, that, that's a classical platonic question and uh, about about the role that beauty plays in attraction and it's, it's, it's an idea that for the most part we moderns have lost the importance of it was such an important concept for because as Plato said it's the thing that we we all most naturally love and if you take love seriously and the take, then you take seriously what it is that we human beings most naturally love and then you begin to wonder about whether there's something better to love and what's the connection between beauty and goodness. I think for us, we think this is all just airy, you know, fairy sort of stuff. But it, it, Garcia takes it seriously, puts it sometimes in ways that could be parodied. See, what's interesting about it is though, there, though this is a place without sexual desire, uh, uh, it's, 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 it's not repressed. Uh, or at least the people who, who protest that they had no sexual desires really don't think of themselves as oppressed. They think of themselves as having seen it's not important. But there is sex in the book. There, there, there is, well, there's sex, but that's the woman he, he, he lives with for a time uh, thinks of herself as simply satisfying uh, his needs. Uh, and she says, look, why didn't you give up this <laughs> stuff about sex? And he says, no, it's important to me. And then she says, interestingly, at one point, a person should never give up what's important to them. I take it meaning, look, if you saw things right, it wouldn't matter to you. It wouldn't be important. So, so what I'm saying is, is, is that what's going on here is, is, is not a puritanical idea where you have to press things under. It's the old platonic idea, if you see things right, this will matter, but that won't matter. And he, he and, and I think, I think, well, I don't know, maybe I'm now reading my own thoughts, philosophical thoughts into it. But I think one of the things that's going on here is that if these physical things, the inexplicable needs we have for one another, you know, no, nobody needs anybody in this book, really. Uh, it's, a, it's as though if any, everybody died, nobody would weep. Maybe they're already dead. Maybe they're already dead. But, 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 but the, the idea of elementary, inexplicable, bewildering needs that we have for one another, which Simone uh, doesn't, won't, won't give, give, give uh, away. And that's because if, if, if that happens, if, if the Platonists were right, that needs enslave others, and et cetera, et cetera, we would lose uh, uh, something utterly fundamental to our humanity. Now, in, insofar as we have to read this to some degree, or take seriously the title of the book, that this is about Jesus, then the most important thing about Jesus, uh, that, that is for people who believe in Jesus, is that he was God become man, he was human. Uh, and didn't belong in that platonic realm of ideas. And that's why the boy, perhaps anticipating what was to happen, had these fearful ideas that there wasn't this necessity and you could fall, fall through. Well, we should say, too, that it's very simply written, oh, it's very clearly well, written, yeah, not well, hard uh, to read at all. No, no. I mean, uh, that's why I said at one point, if you, if you take, you could, you could take it at one, you could describe it at least at one level as just a straight narrative without much enigma at all. And just at that level, it would be a wonderful read. Mm. And I, I, the, the, the thing I learned uh, when um, Cora Diamond challenged my, what I was writing about the Holocaust in, about it being a comparison, is, 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 is that it, you, one shouldn't press too quickly or too hard 
uh, for coherence here. I didn't. I, I looked at a couple of reviews, and one review, I, I noticed that they all said, "Oh, we don't know what this is about." But, but one of them said, uh, though he doesn't fully understand it, uh, these characters keep going around in his head all mm. the time, and uh, I, that, that, that's that's how I feel. I think m many people will be. I, I think they, it would be hard to find a reader who wasn't haunted uh, by this book. And then the question is, is you don't, you don't want just to be haunted. I mean, there is such a thing as a wish for, 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 for clarity of some kind, a wish for understanding. Are you frustrated that you couldn't answer? No, that? no, no, I'm, I'm not. I mean, um, in fact, though I'm a philosopher, I've, I mean, I love Plato, for example, but I'm not at all troubled by contradictions in Plato. I mean, contradictory propositions are just propositions that can't both be true. But they can be incredibly important to reflect on. <laughs> <laughs> so they can be very deep, both of them. Uh, and so I'm not, I'm not inclined, uh, and I think it would be a mistake to press for coherence. But I think there might be a good methodological sort of step of reading the book as, as though you didn't know the title and then finding the enigmas in it and asking yourself, when you remember the title or discover the title or bring it back to, to mind, what it adds. How many mysteries are solved? It's easy to find allusions, Christian allusions, three days under the ground and risen and all, and all that. But quite what you make of them, that's another matter, I think. Well, Ray Gator, it's always a pleasure yeah. to speak with you. And thank you so much for being on the monthly book. Uh, great pleasure. Thank you.